you got your uh, Bibles out, you want to turn them to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. And while you're turning, the children may go back with Miss Tamika. 15. First Corinthians. Verse three and four. Anybody want to read that one? Okay. Now I will remember you, brethren, in what terms I have preached to you the gospel, which you receive, and which you stand, by which you are saved if you hold it fast, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and then he was raised, then was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to this, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 right? at one time most of whom are still alive. Though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, what? Oh, you, that's good. You, okay. All right. <laughs> so, there's a, the resurrection is uh, in chapter, in verse 4 when he says um, that he was raised on the third day. That would be Jesus getting raised from the dead and ascending into heaven, fulfilling the Old Testament scripture in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 12. And those say, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he didn't. He was. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions; he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all of us he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to be Led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and, the, and with a rich man in his death, although he had not he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see the offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear 
their iniquities, therefore I will divide him a portion with the, the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So, that was wrote about 740 to 681 before Christ. And Christ died. And all that happened when Christ was about 33 years old. That's like 700 years. If anybody's ever trying to uh, figure out if this is real stuff. And there's no way Isaiah would have known that without God. What is that? It proves that God's power and that all Jesus had taught and preached was the real deal. If he had not been raised from the dead, the scripture would not have been fulfilled and Jesus wouldn't, wouldn't have been the true Messiah. Why is this important to us? Without Jesus, we got nothing. We would all go to hell. <laughs> and you, we need him. He, we can't go to heaven through our good deeds, through the law. It's just we have to have Jesus. So. All right. And so that is the resurrection. That's what it's for. That's why we need it. Without it, like Eric said, we would go to hell. And like it was said, with gasoline draws, which is what my mother says a lot, actually. She says that often, too. No, I never have. She's told me that many times. And it stuck with me after a while. Yeah, it is, because that's, that's hot. All right, so now. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to go from chapter 5, verse 1, to chapter 7, verse 1. Um, and so we're going to look at the resurrection um, and how it applies us today. Uh, typically, sometimes on a Sunday morning, you come to church and we talk about the resurrection. We just talk about Jesus died, he was raised from the grave, and everybody's happy. Um, but we're going to look at it real and tilting in our lives. Now listen, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. It's probably going to get personal. Um, it's probably going to get real personal. And you'll know when we get there. Um, I want you to know when we get to that point and it gets personal, if you say ouch, that's okay. Alright? Even I said ouch in this. Okay? Um, to the point where I was like, I'd rather do something else than say this today. But you know what? It is for the glory of God. All right, so 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Is everybody there? Amen. Amen. All right, good, good, good. All right, so uh, for the sake of today, I'm going to read this one all the way through. Um, now, typically when you go through and you teach a sermon, you stop at certain points and say, this is what this means, I'm going to explain it this. Kind of like what Eric did for us there. Um, I'm going to do that sometimes, but not often. I might read a chunk of scripture and then just come back. I'm, I'm pretty much going to reiterate what it's saying, but I'm going to put it in terms that would apply to us today that we might understand a little bit different. All right? And when I say ouch, there will be times where you say ouch. It's really personal. All right. So the first book of Corinthians, which Eric read from, was written to a church that had a lot of issues. Okay? That book, uh, people were having an affair with their mother. As odd as that is and how gross as that is, that's, that's what was going on. People were being selfish. Rich people were eating a meal before the poor people come in. Kind of like today we got potluck after at the end of service. Well, what the rich people would do is they would eat all the food and then they would just they would leave. The poor, poor people would show up with no food and, you know, hey, you guys can pray. God will fill your belly, you know. You know, his word's bigger than bread. You know, it was weird. And so Paul wrote to the church to address a lot of the issues. People were hating on each other, complaining about each other. A lot of bad things were happening. Paul found out that the Corinthians got to hear the letter, and they were all upset. Some of them were crying, but they changed. And Paul wrote back and said, hey, listen, I know you're mad at what I said, but I'm not apologizing for my words. I am happy, though, 
And I apologize that you were hurt, but I am happy that you were changed. So let's pick up a verse in chapter uh, 5, verse 1. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on your heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we were still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we should be un- unclothed, but that we should be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But we, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might not longer live to themselves, but for him who has for their sake and died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making this appeal to us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacles in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance and afflictions, hardship, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless nights, hunger, lions and tigers and bears, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punishing and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own afflictions. Affections. In return, I speak to children, widen your hearts also. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Baal? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has a temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As, as God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, go out from them this, and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, behold, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion, to, and completion in the fear of God. Amen. God's wonderful word. So the question is, reading all that, and then what? Right? You read all that, and, and how does that apply to me? What does that even mean to me? Those first couple of verses in chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Just look at that again. For we know that the tent, our earthly home, is destroyed. We have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 
For in this tent we groan, long to put on your heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting on we may not be found naked. For while still in this tent we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be rather fully further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And he is prepared for this very thing in God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. All right, you ever look at your body and kind of groan? You ever wake up and kind of go like, oh. Do you remember when you were 14 and you could just jump out the bed? You could run out that door? Do you remember when you were 18 where you could just, you didn't have to stretch or nothing? People want to sprint and you're like, man, I got it. And you bam, bam. You remember when you were, I, I remember when I was 21, I can play five games of full court basketball back and forth. We played to midnight. And then one day, you get out the bed and what happens? You step and something pops and, did you hear that? What was that? Something on the floor? I don't know. Oh, okay. All right. And you, you know, I was talking to my kids and I said, listen, daddy, you heard. And then what was that? That's my body, baby. Daddy's, daddy's body. It makes sounds now. You know, I used to beatbox back in the day. Now I just need to pop my knee and it's gone. You know, so the, the thing is, our body's grown. Right? You know, I, I, I remember uh, when I was able just to play and have fun, but now if I go and I play, and if I do something fun and enjoyable, like I go play a sport, guess what I have to do right after that? I got to stretch. I got to get some Bengay. I got to get some Tiger Bomb. I, I got to do all of this stuff now. Now, you know, when I was, you know, 14, I just eat McDonald's. Who cares? Give me five Big Macs. Now I eat it, my, my chest hurts a little bit, I'm concerned about the cholesterol level, this does have gluten in it, it's not gluten free, well I can't have it, okay? I got hay fever. All these things now, and what happens? Your body starts to grow. You can't see as good as you used to. I find myself doing this a lot. What? Okay, now I see what you're saying. I find myself doing that a lot, so our bodies are groaning for something more. Right, because it doesn't feel right, does it? When you look in the mirror, you keep saying, get out of the way. Where's that 18-year-old guy? Where's that, where's that 15-year-old that used to do all that stuff? I can't see some old person stands in front of me. Our bodies know that we weren't meant to live like this. Arthritis, high blood pressure, heart disease, cancer. The reason it feels so odd to us is because we were meant to live eternally with Christ forever. And our body yearns for something more. It yearns to be where it's supposed to be. That's what we're hoping for. That's what we're looking for. We're looking to be in something better, something more. But see, here's the thing. You ever think of how much work we put on our bodies? Right? We go to the doctor. We take our medicine. We try to eat healthy. We try to work out. We get all the things we need. And what, what are we really doing it for? Because in the end, guess what happens? We're all going to be in a casket. So many chemicals pumped into our body to preserve how we look. So we can have a nice funeral. So they don't see our bodies bloated and disgusting. That's, that's what we're working for. Life one day is going to lose and death is going to win on us physically. It, it, sometimes it, it blows my mind. That's what we work for. A pretty casket. A nice one, I want you to open up and see me looking good. That's ultimately what we're working for. And see, here's the thing. If we're working towards longevity, we will never take a risk in anything in life. Our bodies should yearn to be with Jesus. Because when I'm yearning to be with Him, I'm willing to take a risk. God might tell you, I want you to move to a bad neighborhood. Well, Jesus, I can't. Why? I might get shot. I was crucified. You worry about getting shot? Well, um, I, I can't take that job, Jesus, because, you know, I don't want to, if they find out I'm a Christian, I'm going to tell them about you, and they might fire me. Do you know I was beaten? And you worry about what they're going to say? See, when you are only consumed with Christ and His purpose and His will, and you seek His kingdom and His righteousness, it doesn't matter how long you live. Jesus only lived to 33 and a half, and he was God's son, and we're trying to make it to 70. Our objective is, well, I want to I make it to 74. I mean, I got insurance now. I got a retirement plan. That's so awesome. And I keep thinking, so I'm going to get to enjoy my money when I'm 75, and I can't barely see nobody. My kids going to have a great time with it, though. Y'all want to go on a trip? 
old crazy daddy in the corner shaking like this. You know, listen, because we're working towards longevity. We're not working towards purpose. When you're working towards purpose, you're only consumed with doing that thing and getting it done and bringing God glory. We're not concerned about our longevity on this earth. We need to be so consumed by Christ that all we focus on is Him. He's our purpose. Because the thing is, we just, we're trying to avoid a horrific death, right? Nobody wants to die in a horrible car accident. Nobody wants to get murdered. No, nobody wants to get cancer. Nobody wants to, to get a, a disease that they can't explain. Nobody wants that. And so we take all these precautions, which is good. Listen, take your medicine, go to the doctor, eat healthy. Don't be sitting here. It's hard to tell people about Jesus when you can't breathe because you're not eating right. Jesus loves you. Yeah, he loves you too, bro. Put the hamburger down. <laughs> You laugh, but I've seen that. I want to tell everybody about Jesus. You can't with heart palpitations. Stop eating it. I'm not saying don't do that. But what I am saying is your focus should be always Christ. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Because of Christ, not because of anything else. Why am I sharing the gospel Why I share the gospel? Because of Christ. It's about purpose. It's about seeing Him. Now listen. The Spirit is what a guarantee that He will return for us, that He is true. And so we always are of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body at home with the Lord. So whether at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. I love how He says that, because listen, your aim at all times is to please Him, not your wife, not your husband, not your kids, not your job, not yourself. It is to please Him. Him, whether you are alive or dead. So everything you do should bring glory to God and, and, and please Him. I'm not saying you can't go to the movies. I'm not saying you can't invite people to your house and have a good time. Depending on what kind of good time you have. But what I'm saying is, you should be pleasing Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due, what is done in the body, whether good or evil. Now this is a part of scripture we don't want to talk about, really. But you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Right? Uh, the way that Paul is written is, because the Romans, you would stand in front of a Roman and he would judge you based off what you've done. We don't like to think about that, right? Because what we like to think is, all my secrets, nobody will know. I'm going to get to heaven and nobody's going to know the stuff that I did. Not one. And God says, listen, there are no secrets you're going to take to the grave. Well, nobody knows what I'm thinking. I got the good outward actions. Listen, I didn't cuss once in the army. Three years, I didn't say one cuss word. Because I said it all in my head. People had no clue what I was saying to them. Oh, yeah, 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 I got that, Sergeant. And everything in my mind is just telling them stuff that they should never hear. And see, when I stand before Christ, guess what? That's exposed. Just because I have an outward appearance doesn't mean that I'm, I'm living for Christ. Just because I talk a good game doesn't mean I'm living for Christ. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, now listen, the good news is there's mercy and grace for those who follow Him. But it's all going to be exposed. You cannot get away with murder. Even if they make a television show that, that leads you that way, you can't. You won't. We get all, all, we think, well, no one's going to know. My wife will never know I had an affair four years ago. At the judgment seat of Christ, the world will know. The world will know. We're going to get judged for our actions, yes. But thanks God for His mercy. Because when my stuff gets exposed, so you, is that Pastor Joe? Oh my goodness. I ain't going to know. Well, I'll be. That guy is something else. Did you see that? Whoa. But the mercy of God will cover me. Listen, the righteousness of God. Let me let me let you know what righteousness means. It doesn't mean I'm doing right. Though you do what is right, you do what brings glory to Him, it means I am in right standing with God. It means I'm in the right line. You ever wait in line for a movie? You, can't, you just can't wait to see it. And then you get there to pay for your ticket. Somebody tells you this is the wrong line. You want to be in that line. And it's so long. You're like, man, I didn't spend like 10 hours. Right? But here's the thing. We're all, if we're following Christ, in the right line. And we're in the line that God's going to say, mercy, mercy, mercy. But if we're in the wrong line, God's going to say, judgment, 
punishment, hell. Listen, there will be no excuse we can say before God, well, God, listen, I, I, the reason I am the way I am, God's going to say, that's, I'm God. I created you. I made you fearfully and wonderfully. Hmm. So there will be no excuse. There will be nothing. We will stand in front of God and will be judged for our works, whether good or evil. But on that day, listen, there is glory for us. There is so much glory in knowing that God is going to look upon us with His grace, with His mercy, because of the sacrifice His Son did. Because of His willingness to give of Himself. Verse 11 goes on and says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, persuade others. But what we, what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We're not committing ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For we, besides ourselves, it is for God. For you in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who might live may no longer live to themselves, but for him who is raised, for him who for their sake has raised from the dead. For now and therefore we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we were once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Now it's an awesome thing what Christ did for us. It's an awesome thing that we're learning to be with Him and longing to be with Him. But here's the thing. The resurrection for some people will mean nothing. Right? Some people are more excited about getting on the varsity team. I made varsity. Some people are more excited that we had an African American president elected. I know I was. I'm not going to lie. I was like, yes, finally. Some people are excited if we get a female elected president. Yes, we did it. Some people are excited that a man landed on the moon. Some people get excited that it's an anniversary, it's your birthday. Listen, the most important day throughout all of history is when Christ died for you and was risen again. That is the day that you were set free. That is the day that God did something great in you. That he died for all. That is a glorious day. Because listen, your outward achievements mean nothing when it comes to the resurrection of Christ. I don't care how great you've been, all the wonderful things you've done. It means nothing when it comes to Christ. And they were so consumed, like we should be so consumed with Christ, that we should be focused on Him. Now the hard part is this, that Christ died for all, but not all would live for Him. He died for every one of us. His sacrifice, some people don't care. Not knowing that His sacrifice, His resurrection, puts us in a place, in a position where God has restored us back to the way it used to be. How many of you ever heard the story of the Garden of Eden? Walking in the cool of the day with the Lord. You got no clothes on. You don't care. You're eating food that's all around you. I mean, you didn't have to work. If you had a baby, apparently it wouldn't have been that tough. But then there was sin and destruction came. There was sin and it interfered. Here's the good news. Christ restores us right back to that. He restores us to the right relationship with God. Now listen, if we don't regard it to the flesh anymore, that means it changes how I view you. Right? It changes how I view myself. It makes me realize this one thing. I'm no better than anybody. I'm no better than a closet homosexual that sings in a church choir. I know that because I've sang in a church choir and I've met tons of them. I'm no better than someone who sells their body on the side of the street, whether it's for money, whether it's for a habit, whether it's because they want to. I'm no better than them. I, I, I'm no better than, than a sinner who's never proclaimed Christ. I am no better than any of those people. The problem we have sometimes in the church is we compare as if we're better. Some of us have been guilty of that. We're all probably guilty of that. Look, look how horrible he is. Do you, can you, can you, you know what he just did? Do you know what he's doing? Right? And that's what we say, right? As if we're good. Right? Good is who are you comparing yourself to? Right? What are we really comparing to? When I say I'm good, who am I comparing myself to? The standard that we compare ourselves to is Christ and Christ alone. That's who we compare ourselves to. Now, that doesn't mean I can't call you out for sin. Don't think like, oh, you judging me. No, you're sinning. Right? That, you know, if you wear a black shirt, that's a black shirt. Don't judge me. It's a black shirt. What you want me to do? Tell you it's green? It's black. Right? It's not saying we don't, we don't talk about sin and address it, but it is saying this. I am no better than anybody because compared to Christ, I am just as in need of grace. Just as in need of mercy. 
even though I know Jesus now, guess what? I am still in need of him. I am still in need of him as the first day I called out his name. I am still in need of him as the first day I looked up to him. I am still in need of Christ and Christ alone. That's who I need in my life. But the thing is, we make it as if people are less than us. I, it bothers me when people put down people who are gay. That really bothers me. I always think to myself, so you're better? Because their sin is apparent. You can see their sin. But you ain't telling anybody know what happens when you go home, right? You don't, you don't talk about that stuff. No. You ain't talking about your personal addiction. No, okay. If I came to live with you for a week, everything would be exposed. Well, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't have un, uh, premarital sex. I am just straight shooter. So you're prideful is what you're saying. No, 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 I'm just saying I got it together. Yeah, no, you don't. Listen, if you had it together, it is, I, I looked in the Bible to see if it was there where, God, where Jesus said, I die for the sins of the world except Joseph because that man, is, he's got it. He don't need me. That boy, he's, that, that's the real deal. Okay. Listen, you're all in need of Jesus. And just because I sit in the church, just because I'm, I'm worshiping God, just because I'm following Him now, guess what? I'm still in need of Him. The same way I needed Him when I accepted Him, I need Him today because I still have to fight against sin. I still have to understand that He died for me and raised again so I can live for Him. I, have to, I still got to fight through that. I wish I was immune to sin. Listen, it's, let me tell you what repentance is really supposed to do. It's not so, you're not supposed to live your life so you can repent less. Well, you know, I, I, I don't have to repent as much. You're supposed to live your life that if I repent, it's because I realize I'm in sin and I want to glorify God. I repent to bring me closer to Him. And as time goes on, this starts to fall out of my life. That's why I repent. And that's why I realize no one is better than me. I'm better than no one. I can't look down on someone. We're all in need of God's grace. Comparing yourself to somebody else, that is, listen, that's a devilish thing. Let me tell you why, because all you're doing is accusing somebody else of their sin. That's all you're doing. That, and that's, that's what Satan means, an accuser of the brethren. Well, if I sit there and look at you like, boy, that, that guy right there, man, he is something else. You know what he did last week? I can't stand him. Oh, I don't like that guy. Guess what I just did? I, I let, this is how beautiful I look. Okay. Look how, look at my glorious thing. Everyone should look out. And listen, that's what Satan did. <laughs> look at me in all my glory. Like we should worship one another. No, listen, when I see your sin, it makes my sin more apparent. When I judge you, it makes me realize I'm judging. Oh, good Lord, I'm, I'm sitting on the throne like I'm God saying, sinner, go to hell. Listen, judgment is when you stand before the throne and God says, heaven or hell. Mercy is God saying, you got time to get it right. That's mercy. And so the question is, where do you stand in that? Because the reality is this, we're all on the same boat, but we're all not getting off at the same bay. We're all heading towards the judgment seat of Christ. But the question is, are you going to be heading on the bay that says mercy and grace? Or are you going to be heading on the bay that says hell? That's what it's going to come down to. That's what you got to think about. Because God desires we all get off on the same place. He desires that we all come to his mercy. All come to his grace. That is what God desires. And that is what we're here for. Now what goes on. And it says in verse 16, For now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Now, I'm going to stop there, because now we're about to do a little bit of ouch. Okay. We'll get to the rest, hopefully, but it's new creation. The old has passed away. So the question, the first thing I have to think about is, can I see that in my life that I'm new? Can I see the resurrection power of Christ so evident in my life that I know that I'm new? Or am I still living a decaying, sinny life? Think about it like this. If I went to the, I've done this example before in the past. If I went to the graveyard and got, dug up somebody's clothes, dug up their body, they like, all like that, and I put their clothes on, and I came in here and went, so, right? First 
first thing you think about is, that's disgusting. That's gross. You went to a graveyard, dug up somebody's clothes and put them on your body, and you walk around here like nobody should do nothing. If I sat down next to you in the church and all the dust and worms crawling in my pocket, and I come all around you like, hey, what's going on, man? You good? Hey, man, I'm so glad you're here. And I gave you that big hug like, mm, or that little, how you doing? God bless you. Right? <laughs> you would think that's disgusting. Because that's gross. Those clothes are dead. You're supposed to be new. Right? So the question is, can you see the resurrection power of Christ in your life? Now, let's, let's take it a, a deeper level. We're going we're gonna to build up. We're going to start up below. Your words. Now listen, when things are going great and I got no conflict, guess what? You can see Jesus in my life. When I'm loving you, you loving me, Jesus. You see it, don't you? You hear the music behind me coming in. Then you see a choir. When you got an issue and I come in to help you, hey, how you doing? Oh. When I used to be in the army, they used to play a trick on me. I used to hate it. I would walk in the room, somebody would go, oh, and I would go, come on, man. Right? They did. And it, it hurt, though. I was like, dude, for real, stop. Ain't no choir behind me. And I had to check because I was scared of angel was standing behind me like, yes, we are. But here's the thing. When I'm in conflict, can I hear Jesus in my words? Or do I look for certain words to use to hurt you? Do I, do I remember conversations from the past and then take those words, twist them, and throw them in your heart like a dagger so you can hurt? Because I want to get my point across. I, I don't care if I'm right. I don't care if you're wrong. I want you to feel pain. So I'm going to inflict pain on you. I'm going to hurt you and make you pay for what you said to me or what I think you said because I can't handle the conflict. Is that the resurrection power of Christ or is that my dead sin in my hand? Am I sorry that I got caught? And if I hadn't got caught, I'd still do it? Or am I thinking, well, I got to do it better next time if you're going to catch me? Is that the resurrection power? Of Christ in my life? Or is that just me living a double life? See, some things... Are, you throw weed at me, I can... Whatever. But throw some other stuff. Throw some dirty magazines. I, well, let me catch that real quick. Put it back in my pocket. I'll see you later. Right? Is, is Christ evident in my life? Or am I just being a joke? Am I really new? Or am I trying to live this old lifestyle? Am I still worrying about things even though I say I give it to God? No, Lord, no, I'm afraid about it. Or am I actually going before the throne saying, Father, I'm still struggling. I lay this at your feet. Do I trust Him or do I not? How do, how do I handle conflict? Am I a bully? They tell what bullies do. They try to intimidate some kind of way. Whether physically, verbally, or like that. They want to intimidate you. They want to bring you down to a different level. It's not about being right or wrong. It's about you submitting to their will. Does that sound like the resurrection power of Christ? Where I'm speaking the truth and love? Or does that sound like someone who just wants to get their way? You know, in most cases of abuse, you know why people abuse people? Because they're angry with God. You know why you punch people and hit and, and rip because you're angry that your will isn't being accomplished. And you're trying to get it accomplished, so you're angry at God. The only way to fix your will is to physically fix it on somebody else. I remember being in Georgia, talking to my parents on Skype. Me and Tim began a great old time. And we hear this yelling outside of our house. And I said, girl, what is that? And I jump up, you know, because I'm an army guy kick over that door and I see a husband and wife like this. The guy said, I saw the wife's face go like that. Now I go out there. Because don't think it's the first time I fought somebody. Don't touch me either. But I go out there. We take the guy down to the ground. Tell him to calm down. Said some other beautiful things to him that we won't repeat. Get up. Please come take them away. We're good. I'll come back inside like, yeah, we fixed that. Next, next day, it's the same thing. Abuse. See, physical, it's not going to change anybody. 
If I punch your lights out, it's not going to change. It's not going to stop you from abusing me. It's not going to stop you from hitting somebody and kicking somebody. It's not going to stop you. The problem is you're mad and discontent because you can't control something and you want to yell at God, but you're too weak to say it to God's face. So what you do is you go to somebody who's weaker and you knock the... You hit him. Get him. It's abuse. It's weakness. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. That's not, that's not, that's not being a, a grown-up. It's not being a Christian. That's dead. Listen, because we're not dealing with it. As opposed to going before the throne of grace and saying, Lord, I don't understand. Lord, I don't get it. As opposed to calling your wife all kind of names and thinking it's all right. Well, I didn't cuss her out this time, but she's yelling and you're screaming. No, it's old. Listen, a man is supposed to be a warrior for his woman. Not an attacker. Not Genghis Khan. Ravaging everything. And then you expect him to do something for you later on tonight? Some days, boy. Some days. You can't handle it the way that will bring glory to God. And you got to say, okay, Lord. But no, no, no. A man is supposed to look at her and love her as Christ loved the church, gave himself for her, wash her in the word. Well, we're not married, but we're doing married things. No, you're, you're supposed to love her. You're supposed to wash her and keep her pure until that day. Remember, you represent Christ. You're new. Well, back in the day, no. Not back in the day. Well, that's how I handle it. It doesn't work. If your heart is not changed, listen, the issue is not with the physical, the issue is with your heart. Your heart has to change. Amen. I can change all the outward things. Listen, I've been there. I've been there with me and Tamika. We weren't married yet, but staring at each other like, hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Oh, you want to come over? Okay, you come over. Let's pray together. Let's pray laying down and see what the Lord says. <laughs> Like that's going to do something. No, my heart was wicked. Because I wasn't content in Christ. Listen, your contentment has to be in Jesus. Because guess what happens if you lay down? Guess what happens if you sin, you smoke, you drink, you lie, you cheat, you steal? Guess what happens? You wake up the next day and your problem is still right there in your face. You're still discontent. Guess what happens when I'm tired of my wife and I just hit her? Guess what? It's still there. My problems are still here. So as opposed to going before the throne of grace and manning up and saying, God, help me. I'm just going to take it out on the weaker one. Because they can't fight back. And I wish they'd tell somebody. That's not God. It's a coward. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. If, if you, you hit your spouse or something like that, come tell me. I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to beat you. I'm not going to yell and scream at you because I told you that don't work. I've already done that before. I've taken swings. I've swung back. i kicked people. That's the first time I've been in a fight. That's the first time I've been jumped. It doesn't matter. It doesn't work. What I find is that their heart is not towards Christ. It doesn't work. You're new. You are a godly man who takes care. Listen, for you women, you're new. If you're moving to the beat of someone else's song, they say, go there, you go there. They say, shut up, you shut up. You know, you know, you know I can tell someone's being bullied or abused in their house? Because I've done this for a long time. I, when I'm having a conversation with both, I see who's looking at who. Well, how do you feel about that? Uh, I'm okay. And somebody did it one time this conversation. I did this. <laughs> what, what, what? I don't know what you're looking at either. I'm trying to find what you're staring at. And then the guy looks at me. I look at him. Oh, she's looking at you. Oh, 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 I didn't know that. Let me stand in front of him. How do you feel when, when you see someone bow like this and they say okay because they don't want to fight because they're scared of what will come next? It's abuse. It's being abusive. But we have to stand against that. With the body of believers, you got something you can't, you can't, you can't be okay with that. Ever. Ever. I'm not okay with it. And yes, I pay attention. I notice if you come and remark to me about it. I will pay attention. And don't think my silence is saying it's okay. Trust Joe. Somebody's going to have a talk. It may not be today, 
But you best believe somebody's going to have a talk. Amen. Here's the thing you have to realize. When you dance to the beat of another man's rhythm, people get paid to do that in clubs. That's not who you are. When you have to give yourself over physically to somebody else to get what you want, people do that on a corner. That's not who you are. You have to realize that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You have to realize that God says a good wife is an inheritance from the Lord to a man. You have to realize that God says you're more precious than rubies. And then the person, the man that finds you has found the good thing. Once you realize that's who you are, you tell that guy, no. Man. You find another one. Because it's apparent I'm not for you. Well, he can't wait. Then you don't need to, why would you, don't wait for him. Don't wait for that. Would you, this? Listen, I'm the king of looking at, at, at girls and looking at guys and saying, Him? Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> Is he rich? Does he cook? Because him. You know, before, after I met Tamika, I realized, well, before I met Tamika, I had to realize something. Boy, I can do better. I'm, really? Waiting on you? That kid? Man, I got some low standards. Listen, you have to raise the bar. You want a person to treat you like you're a queen? Then go find a king. Stop messing with these little poppers who don't know what they're doing. They ain't got no ambition in life. You're new. You're created new. You're a new creation. The old you. I don't care if you sold your body. I don't care if you lost your virginity. Guess what? That's gone. The new you is what's worth it. The new you, it says, you will wait for me. I remember that day Tamika shut everything down before we got married. <laughs> Broke my legs in half. You what? Oh, my God. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. Man, no. <laughs> Man was it? <laughs> but here's the thing, though. It made me raise the standard. It made me go, no. If a man balls his fist at you, pick up the phone and call the cops. Because you say, no. I am more than this. You beat an animal to get it to submit. You beat a dog to make it do what you want. You are not a dog. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's who you are. You're not a liar. Liars will not be in heaven. You're an honest person. You will be held accountable. You tell the truth. You commit and tell your sin. You're not a judger of people. You don't look down on folks. Because listen, even if you hit somebody, and if you have hit your spouse, you have hit somebody, come talk to me after church. I'm not going to look down on you. I'm not going to say you filthy little. I'm not going to try to take you out back and tell you what a man is. Because it doesn't work. We're going to deal with your heart. If you feel you're being abused, I want you to talk to Miss Tamika, and then me, Miss Tamika, and everybody would get together and sit down and have a conversation. Because there is redemption at the cross. There is salvation waiting for you. And this is why the gospel works so well, because it speaks to the core of who we are. And it tells us you don't have to be that way anymore. So you're new. You're new. The old you has passed away, and behold, who you are has shown itself. And it's here. It's here. It's today. And all this, I love this, all this is from God. All of this is from God. All of it. And He says, here. And through who Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ God, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us the message of what? Reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God makes the appeal through us. We employ on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For his sake, he made him sin who knew no sin. Listen, this is what God did. God said, not only have I changed you and transformed you, I have made you my messenger to the world. 
You don't have to be ashamed of your past. Oh, that is so glorious. You don't have to be. You don't have to be ashamed of what you've done. I don't have to be. I don't have to be ashamed of my struggles that I, that I, that I had to work through. I don't have to be. I am now a messenger. My struggle has become my pulpit. My issues have become the thing I say, no, Christ changed me, he can change you. It has changed me now. And so when I speak, I speak from a place of conviction. I speak from a place that is deep within my soul. I feel the pain within me. And so when I reach out to a brother I know is struggling with that same issue that I had an issue with, it is real. Because I know how they feel. I get it. And even if I don't get it, I have the solution for the problem. And that's Christ Jesus. No program. No daddy to come save you. No no wife is going to do it. No finding the perfect person. That's not going to do it. It is Jesus who does it. It is yeah, That's bad English. Who cares? It is Jesus that does it. It is Jesus that sets us free. It is Jesus that says, now speak my truth from this. Speak it loud so everyone can hear. Let my glory be shone all around so they may see the transformed power. Because he made Christ my sin. All of it. Every bit of it. He said Christ will be it. And he will die for you. So you may be right standing with me. Who does that? Who takes upon everything that you have done and they've done nothing but they say I will die for it. But I am so powerful I will raise again. I'll rise again and then I will heal them and make them whole in me because I am God. That's true love. Now it says work together with him and we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says in the faithful time I listen to you in the day of salvation I have helped you. Now I want you to hear this clear. You think no one has heard your cries. You think no one has heard you weeping out for more. And God says, I have heard every whimper that has come out your mouth. I have seen every tear that has fallen behind your cheek and not on the face of your cheek. I have heard the silent screams at night. I have been there when you were restless and kicking and screaming. I have been there when you turned your body over because you just wanted to feel affection. I have been there. I have been there when you turned to pornography only because you were looking for contentment in a woman as opposed to looking for contentment in Christ and now you're disappointed so you turn to this thing, this nasty thing so you can maybe feel better about yourself. I've been there and I've heard your screams and your sin. I've been there when you drank that alcohol and you thought nobody was looking. I've been there when you said I just need a break. I've been there when you pumped your veins full of junk. I've been there when you've accused and, and ridiculed. I've been there when you felt down and out. I've been there every time and I'm telling you today is the day of salvation. It's right now. It's not tomorrow. It's not next week. It's now. And I have helped you. I've helped you every step of the way. And I will continue to help you. Why? Because I love you. And you can't push my love away. The Bible says we can't run from God's love, neither height nor depth, no angel nor demon, nor life nor death can separate us from God's unfailing love. That's the resurrection of power of Christ because we tend to look for contentment in something else. We don't want to be an ambassador for Christ, we want to be an ambassador for ourselves because we're looking for God in people. That's the problem. Every young lady I've seen who's given herself over is because they're looking for a man to fulfill a void that only God can fill. Listen, sex will only last so long. The next morning, you still got issues. Drinking, drugs, alcohol, abuse, punching, fighting, screaming, only so long. Those issues are coming down. If you got contentment in Jesus, guess what you got? You got joy. You Listen, I tell people, I'm not afraid to leave a job. I've been threatened. We'll fire you. And I go, Sam, the first time won't be the last. If Christ tells you to leave, guess what? I'm gone. You won't have any money. He, 
I'd rather walk in obedience. Because he's my contentment. If your wife rejects you and tells you no, if your girlfriend now, she better, after this, no more of this at all. And you go, oh, I can't believe you don't do that. That's messed up. Where's your contentment? Is it in Jesus? If you can't watch your Netflix show, because, oh, come on, man, we got to get out of here. I got to, come on, my show on. Where's your contentment? Uh, I might get fired. It's your contentment and satisfaction in what you have, or is it in Jesus alone? Listen, the reason he puts that in us, this feeling of nothing, this feeling of I want more, is because Christ is what we need. It is to bring us to a place where we say, where else is there to go? I need something. And Christ says, it's me. You need me. That's what you need. All this other stuff, listen, I love the food, I love the Easter egg, that's great. But all that's going to fade away. The food will mold. The toys will end up in somebody's garage sale for 95 cents. All that stuff will go at some point. But do you have the thing that will never fade, will never disappoint? Your boyfriend, don't care how good he is. Listen, it, he's not going to do it. That woman that you want to just, just do all this kind of stuff to, it ain't going to do it. If you're looking for contentment in marriage and children and jobs and family, you're going to... You lost already. And Christ says, I let it that way so you can come to me. Because then we're so consumed by Christ, so filled with the Spirit, that we turn to Jesus and say, you are my everything, God. If the world will leave me and all I had was you, I am fine. Where you are, I want to be. If he's not in that relationship, get out of it. But I love him. Maybe not. Have you ever looked up and wondered, why am I doing this? How did I get here? This is not who I am. Why? You know what God says? Come here. But I'll have to leave. You want to keep experiencing that? You want to come with peace joy. You want to have some real fun, real joy, real happiness? Come to me. I'm a mess. Great. Come as you are. When I had babies and they just all over the place, I didn't say, ugh, fix yourself up. No. Yeah, I do. Can you change yourself? No, okay. But when they were crawled to me, I would come to them and I would clean them and make them whole. Why? Because that's my child. And for some of us, we, we just, it's all over us. You need to come to Jesus. It's time. Mm. Oh, come on, come on, come on. It's time. So instead of bowing down to a man and being beaten, instead of beating someone, Instead of uh, being yourself, instead of being lewd, instead of being crazy, instead of lying, instead of cheating, instead of stealing, instead of uh, compromising who you are for the sake of somebody else who's not even care about you, give it to Jesus. All of it. Every bit of it. Now when you do that, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to have to have some endurance. You know why? Because it's going to get tough. It gets tough being a Christian. When I hear people like, well, I'm good, man. I'm a Christian. No, it, I, I, I've never said, I'm good, I'm a Christian. I'm like, dang, man. Oh, endurance. They're making fun of me. I remember being made fun of because I, I, I was a virgin until I got married. Are you a virgin? And I was telling you, yeah, I'm a real man. I can wait. Pump. <laughs> I said that a couple times. But, I, no, no, man. Christ is my contentment. You're going to have afflictions. You're going to have hardships, calamities. You might be beaten. You might be in prison. You might be in a riot. I've been in one. You might have labors and sleepless nights. You might be hungry. In other words, you might have some real issues, but you know what God says? You can do it because I'm with you. I got you. I am your strength. Because what's going to happen is we're going to want to fall back on what we used to do and rely on that. I'm really stressed. I just got to get high and I feel good, man. Dude, I feel so much better. I'm really stressed with my wife. I, just, I need to do something with her and I'm going to feel better. That ain't it. 
You know what you're going to have to do? What I had to learn to say, Christ is enough. And that's hard to say. That's hard to say you want to punch somebody. That's hard to say when you want to just tell somebody off, Christ is enough. That's hard to say because we look to our wives, say something good about me, make me feel good about myself, baby. No, your wife, no, that's not what she's there for. That is Christ who's supposed to be doing that. Christ is enough. Now, if you don't believe me, look at your life now where you have not submitted to Christ. It's horrible, ain't it? I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just going to praise Jesus in church. Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna. What about when you're tempted? What about you just you want to let it all out? Is he still Hosanna? <laughs> then he's not enough yet. You haven't submitted. You haven't surrendered. He is enough. And I challenge you by purity, by knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God. Do it. Listen, you're going to have to be brave and courageous. I'm going to be honest with you. You're going to do this all, and, and, and I'm going to tell you, it's worth it. It was so worth it. I remember how I, I was so scared to ask to get to marry me. But you know what? I see her. I saw her walking down that aisle, looking at me. I'm looking at her. She looking at me. I'm starting to sweat. She looking at me. I look back and saying, I want to pass out. You are? Yeah. Okay. But I said something. She's worth it, man. I'm have to give up all of this craziness. You know, I, I don't believe in boyfriend girlfriends. You know why? Boyfriend girlfriends lead to two things. The first one is babies. No, they don't. Shh. Yes, they do. Lead the babies. The second thing you know what it does, you practice divorce. You get with a girl, six months, we're done. Get with another girl, oh, six months, we're done. That's divorce. That's all that's practicing. No. I'm not going to look down if you got a boyfriend. I'm going to talk to him. I'm not going to look down if you got a girlfriend. I'm going to talk to her too. But I'm saying... You really want somebody? Then you say, if you really want to be with me, you will wait for me. I gotta wait 10 years. Am I worth it? I don't know. Then you don't, I don't need to be with you. If they say, but I gotta wait, then that's, that's a clear sign. No. No. Leave this guy alone. If that girl says, well, you know what? How about we just do something? No. You leave them alone. If they really want you, that bad, like I wanted Tamika, I'll wait, girl. How long? As long as I need to. What she want? I'll change. I'll grow two more inches if I need to for you, goo. Goo, who is that? <laughs> I mean, boo. We don't like My boo. Anyway. But you do that. You do it. Because it's worth it. And listen, you're going to be treated as an imposter. People are going to call you fake. They're going to say you a sellout. You used to be. People are going to make fun of you. And listen, I'm not worried about the world making fun of me and calling me fake. It's the church folk that always did that to me. Well, you being fake. No, I'm not. I'm living for Jesus. Whatever. No, they're going to call you that. But you know what? You push through that. You might be called unknown. You might be feeling like you're dying. You may feel like everything is falling apart. You may be called poor. But guess what? you got everything you need wrapped up in Jesus. But it's only if you want Him. You keep Jesus out of a particular part of your life, that part of your life is going to crumble. You ever see the color purple? Everything you think about is going to crumble. That's all that's going to happen to you. I can tell you, I don't even have to do this crazy thing that what the Goldberg did with the crazy hair at the time. No, listen, I'm going to tell you, you don't surrender to Christ in that part of your life, it's gone. Now, to wrap this up, because, good Lord, to wrap this up, I'm going to hit on this last part. When God said to cut those things out from among you, when he said, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? I'm going to wrap this up in a, in a nice little thing, and then we're going to get finished. For some of you, you need to cut off relationships in your life. And that's just being honest. Right? Listen, there are certain friends I had that can probably get me to do anything. Right? I heard one pastor say he'd be walking down the street talking about Jesus, got his Bible open, his friends call him, call him up, little John, he just turned right into that guy. He's like, let's turn up, man, let's do that. Some of you need to cut relationships off. 
for the sake of yourself. Stop being used and abused. Some of you need to get a dumb phone. Now I know what you're saying, what is a dumb phone? Who, who's got a smartphone? A handy dandy smartphone? You can do anything on the can't you? You can, you can call, you can text, you can watch porn, you can um, uh, watch Netflix, you can uh, take pictures of people and keep, you can do anything. And they keep leading you to sin. If that's you, get a dumb phone. Get a phone you can only text where you got to do one, two, three, A. Okay. One, two, three. Ah, man. Hey, can you call me? Call and you hear me. You might need one. Why? Because if it's leading you to sin, get rid of it. Break it off. If you ain't said I do yet, think about it. If you're 14 especially, think about it. I can think about it for you. I can give you the answer already. Cut some stuff off. If the people that you're around are only doing things that lead you to death and not living for Christ, guess who you need to stop hanging out with? I had to move to a different state. Why? Because they're crazy. And they're making me crazy. Why? Because living for Jesus is more important. My contentment's in Him. Your friends, they can only make you feel good for so long. Only so many parties you can do. Only so many times you can turn up. I mean, once you get to the 10th level turned up, what is after that? At some point, you got to say, you know what, man? I can't. I'm tapped out. I'm done. And listen, today, if that's you, if you said, I've had enough of this, and you need to make some changes, we're going to pray with you today. We're going to make some changes today. I talked about a lot of things in this. I did. Intentionally. This is something I've been praying about for a whole month. If you said ouch and you feel like that was personal attack, don't hey, take it how you want. But I want you to know I'm, because I love you. Because I care about you. Because I want to see you feel with his joy, not with your destruction. Not with your wrath. Not with your anger. I want you to see filled with his peace and find contentment in him. And after we finish, you want to come talk to me a little bit? If you hit somebody, come tell me. If you're being hit, go tell Mr. Mika. If, if, if you are lying, cheating, and stealing, and all that crazy stuff, let's talk about it. Let's get some people to walk with you. If you say, enough, I want to walk with Christ for real, let's pray. Let's get it done. I don't care about the food like you think I do. I care about you. Amen? Alright, let's close our eyes and we're going to pray real quick. Now. So if you're here today, well, everybody respecting for closing their eyes and heads bowed, if you're here today and you're saying, I want Jesus, I need Him. If you came to that realization today, just acknowledge it somehow. You can raise your hand, you can tap your foot. I just No one is looking, just let me know. Okay. Now listen, if you're here today and you're saying, I want to change, I am tired of the way I'm living, just acknowledge it. You don't want to raise your hand, you don't want to take foot, that's fine with me. But when we pray, I want you to mean it from your heart. I want you to truly mean it. I want you to mean it. And then I want you to Tell somebody so we can walk with you. If you're in a relationship where you need some help, at the church, let us know. If you're still living your old way, just masking it with some holiness and some Jesus music, let's talk about that. Now we're going to pray together. We're going to pray for repentance and true change. Like I said, if, if, if you're any of the people we describe, I want you to mean this. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you right now and I give my life to you. All of me, I surrender to you. Protect me, guide me, and strengthen me that I may follow you all the days of my life. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. I know we do prayer requests. We're going to take those down. It is time to... It's almost 12.30. Oh, no. Don't tell me to go along because I'm ready. You know what I'm saying? I got everything. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to uh, we're going to just close out in prayer. And that prayer was important. It really was important. We're going to close out in prayer. And then um, you'll get direction from the kitchen as far as food and stuff like that. Uh, but we just want to pray and close you out and pray a blessing over you. Um, and I love you guys. I'm going to tell you that right now. I do it because I love it, man. I didn't love the Lord like I do. So next week, too, we're also going to have...